Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Meadows Museum's Learning at Lunch. I am Ann Kinseth. I'm the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum and just want to thank you all for, for joining us um, at lunch today. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Arvid Nelson is Curator of Rare Books and Manuscripts and Librarian for Special Collections at Bridwell Library at Southern Methodist University. He came to Dallas uh, in 2016 from the University of Minnesota, where he served as curator and archivist at the Charles Babbage Institute for History of Information Technology. He's a former EPH Goldsmith Fellow at Rare Book School and former section chair of the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of the Association of College and Research Librarians, Libraries. He received his BA in Greek and Latin from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities and MAs in Classics and Library and Information Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Nelson is currently a PhD student in SMU's Department of Art History, where he's focusing on modernism, abstraction, and identity, and the book arts. And I am so pleased to welcome him today uh, in conjunction with the Meadows Museum's current exhibition, Fossils to Film, The Best of SMU Collections, for his talk, which he's titled The Book um, as Art and Artifact. So welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and let me welcome everybody to The Book as Art and Artifact. Uh, the title of my presentation today comes from a phrase I frequently use to describe how scholars and students engage with the rich holdings of Bridwell Library Special Collections. While some people certainly engage with the subject matter of rare books, Many others study them for their bindings, paper, typography, illustrations and illuminations, as well as the book plates and marginal inscriptions that attest to historical use and the lives of individual items handed down through time. I think it's important to emphasize these aspects of research because most people who are aware of Gridwell think of us as the Bible library, and with good reason. The library's primary affiliation is with the Perkins School of Theology. Yet when the library was founded, its charge was twofold, to be both a theological library and a, quote, rare book library of preeminence, unquote. Now, these charges are not mutually exclusive and often overlap. The department holds truly significant collections of historic Bibles, notably those of Elizabeth Perkins Prothro and Thomas J. Harrison, as well as related devotional and ecclesiastical materials. Yet the collections further encompass important works of literature, history, philosophy, and art. In addition to Perkins, uh, we also serve the instructional and research interests of faculty and students from many departments, most notably art history, history, advertising, English, and world languages. We also give presentations to classes from other area colleges and universities, high schools, and community groups. And our exhibitions program draws a wide range of audiences. And yet whenever I speak to people, both from within and outside of our campus community, the phrase I typically hear is, I didn't know Gridwell had that. And so I'm grateful to the Meadows Museum for the opportunity to showcase just some of Gridwell's treasures in the current exhibition and for this opportunity to speak to you today. I will briefly discuss four of the items currently on display, the Nuremberg Chronicle, the Kelmscott Chaucer, the jeweled binding by Sangorsky and Sutcliffe, and Salvador Dali's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. If you have listened to the exhibition's audio guide description of the Nuremberg Chronicle, I apologize for any repetition you will hear today. But when I was recording it, I found that my first take was almost twice as long as the time I had allotted. And so I had to cut several details, which I'm happy to have the opportunity to include today. Although I should note, as I was editing today, I had to cut even more details out of the rest of the talk, but perhaps we'll have an opportunity to cover those in the Q&A. So. Hartman Schadel's Liber Chronicarum is a landmark publication of the 15th century the era described by scholars as the incunable period of printing. The Latin word incunabulum means in the cradle and refers to the origins of the printing press in Germany in the middle of the 15th century. Incunabula or incunables in English are books printed from about 1455, the date of Gutenberg's Bible, through 1500. 
I should note here that Bridwell Library holds an internationally renowned collection of incunabula comprising more than 1,100 items. The Liber Chronicarum was printed by Anton Koberger in 1493 in the German city of Nuremberg, which is the source of the book's popular title in English, the Nuremberg Chronicle. Schadel was a doctor and book collector who pieced together biblical stories and contemporary humanist scholarship, much of which he found in his own extensive collection of printed and manuscript works. The Nuremberg Chronicle is perhaps best known as the first book to contain extensive printed illustrations and as the most heavily illustrated book of the 15th century, featuring more than 1800 woodcut illustrations designed and produced by Wilhelm Pleidenwerf and Michael Wolgemuth. The earliest printed books copied much of the appearance of the handwritten manuscripts that preceded them, one of which we see here today, an early 15th century manuscript missal from Venice. Scribes who wrote out manuscript texts would leave spaces for others to fill in with elaborate initials, colorful flourishes, and miniature painted scenes. Similarly, early printers would leave spaces in the text for others to fill in with colorful enhancements by hand. And here's an example of a space that was left blank, although you'll see in the middle there's what's called a guide letter, which was instructive for the scribe who would be, or the illuminator who would be going in to, to do the handiwork so that they knew what letter they had to, to put in without having to read the text. Um, this method, however, was expensive, time-consuming, and incapable of ensuring consistent results across multiple copies. The book that Schadel had in mind required a different approach. The Nuremberg Chronicle deftly weaves biblical stories with history, geography, folklore, mythology, and ethnography to present a history of the world from creation up to the time of its printing. This complex story is told with almost equal emphasis on words and images in order to present an engaging and accessible work. The geography of the known world is described through maps and the rise of prominent cities are illustrated with cityscapes. Family trees outline biblical genealogies and those of contemporary monarchies featuring portrait busts linked by elaborate vines. Fanciful creations portray monstrous and mythological creatures. And the final section describes the end times as recounted in the book of Revelation. 14 different page layouts were devised to arrange the heretofore unseen complex relationship of texts and pictures. In order to achieve this, a method of printing images at the same time and in the same manner as the movable lead type was required. Woodcut provided an ideal opportunity as it and letterpress type are both forms of relief printing in which a raised surface conveys ink to the page. For the illustrations, artists cut away the wood from areas that should appear as white space, leaving behind raised lines. These wooden blocks were then locked into the form containing the type and everything could be inked and printed at once. Of the 1800 woodcuts, many are repetitions of the same images. Because readers at the time did not require the same level of visual accuracy as audiences today, a picture representing the expected characteristics of a type of person sufficed. Thus, 96 unique portrait blocks were used to represent 598 individuals. Similarly, with the exception of specific cities deemed important enough to receive customized illustration, most were represented by one version or another of standardized images. And so 53, cities were, 53 images of cities were used to represent 101 different locations. The Nuremberg Chronicle has the further distinction of being the first book intended to be published in both Latin and vernacular German editions. The Latin edition was published on the 12th of July, 1493, and George Alt's German translation was published on December 23rd of the same year. Owners of these volumes commonly hired artists in order to color these images 
so many copies today still bear some unique handiwork. The copy displayed on the left, a gift of Elizabeth Perkins Prothrow, includes hand coloring by an illuminator hired by the book's 16th century owners, Hartmut XIII von Kronberg and his wife, Margarete Brendel von Homburg, influential nobles from Kronberg in Taunus, Germany. They're identified by the family's coats of arms, which you can see painted down below. And you'll see on this other copy that hasn't been filled in, they left these shields blank in order for people to do just this. Um, Bridwell Library holds one copy of the German edition and three copies of the Latin, including Mrs. Prothrow's and that of Ruth and Dr. Lyle Sellers, which is the one that we see on the right. Moving ahead, the Kelmscott Chaucer is the popular name of the edition of the works of Geoffrey Chaucer designed by William Morris and published in 1896 by the Kelmscott Press. Morris founded the press in 1891 in an effort to revive the quality and craftsmanship of 15th century printers. Over the following centuries, more expedient printing methods were sought as efficiency, speed, and cost continued to drive industrial developments. By the 19th century, critics reacting to what they saw as the deterioration of quality formed the arts and crafts movement, which sought to revive traditional handcrafts and promote thoughtful design. Morris was prominent in the movement as a writer and a designer, notably of textiles and wallpaper, as well as books. The Kelmscott Press, which operated from 1891 to 1899, profoundly influenced the course of printing. Drawing inspiration from medieval artisans for both manufacturing techniques and aesthetic principles, Morris created thoughtful, Morris created works of thoughtful typography and rich ornamentation that constitute a bridge between early printers and the fine presses and book artists of the 20th century and today. Morris articulated his goals and priorities in a short treatise published as a note by William Morris on his aims in founding the Kelmscott Press. Here he wrote, it was the essence of my undertaking to produce books which it would be a pleasure to look upon as pieces of printing and arrangement of type. Looking at my adventure from this point of view then, I found I had to consider chiefly the following things, the paper, the form of the type, the relative spacing of the letters, the words, and the lines, and lastly, the position of the printed matter on the page. Morris used a black ink made without modern chemicals, which he imported from Hanover, Germany. He also insisted on using all linen handmade paper produced according to his specifications by Joseph Batchelor in Kent, England. The Kelmscott Chaucer was completed on May 8, 1896, five months before Morris's death in October of that year. The work represents the culmination of his efforts in typographic and bibliographic design. He created the typeface used in the Chaucer in 1893 and he designed the book's ornate borders and 26 large initial words. The 87 woodcut illustrations were drawn by Edward Byrne Jones, whom Morris had met when the two attended Oxford. Bridwell Library's holdings of modern and contemporary book arts is extensive, often striving for comprehensive collections of individual artists and presses. While the library holds but 26 of the Kelmscott's known 56 publications, the collection includes multiple copies of some titles and is further enhanced by important ephemer ephemera, including trial pages, subscribers' notices, catalogs, and ad advertisements. The library also holds a bound manuscript copy of Morris's own collection of early printed books, as well as four of the books from that collection. Of the Chaucer, Bridwell holds four copies. That on display is one of a few printed on vellum rather than paper and is inscribed by Morris to Byrne Jones. Deckard Turner, Bridwell Library's first director, purchased the copy from the British bookseller, author, and bibliophile Colin Franklin. Franklin later facilitated Bridwell's acquisition of one of only two copies printed on vellum of the Dove's Press Bible as well as the archives and complete output of the Ashendine Press 
including the Ashen Dean's Dante printed on vellum. On January 16, 1977, in the Perkins Chapel, Franklin gave his now famous address on what he called the triple crown of printing in celebration of Bridwell's assemblage of the vellum copies of these three titles. When the vellum copy of the Chaucer was rebound by the Eddington Bindery in 1974, Franklin presented the library with an album of documentary photographs. Among the three copies printed on paper is one inscribed by Burne Jones to his daughter, Margaret McHale, found in 1897 by the Dove's Bindery. This copy is enhanced by the addition of a number of draft sketches by and manuscript letters to Burne Jones himself. The second paper copy retains the original binding of blue paper over boards, while the third was rebound in 1977. Moving ahead a few years to the beginning of the 20th century, we now examine an example of fine binding at its most sumptuous. Calf skin is inlaid with colored goat skin, gold, eight opals, and one carnelian. The unique binding is the work of Sangorsky and Sutcliffe, Britain's foremost bindery of the early 20th century. Francis Sangorsky and George Sutcliffe met in 1896 at the London County Council's Central School of Arts and Crafts, where they were students of the binder Douglas Cockerell, who was also the brother of Sidney Cockerell, the private secretary of William Morris. You can really see what a, a close community this was. In 1898, each won awards for their work, and they were employed as apprentices in Douglas's Cockerell bindery. They, when they were laid off in 1901, they formed the firm Sangorsky and Sutcliffe. Bridwell holds 20 titles bound by Sangorsky and Sutcliffe. A few are rebindings for 15th and 16th century books like this 1522 Hebrew grammar. While certainly fine binding, these tend to be much more simple designs. The remainder are specialty bindings for 20th century publications by private presses, such as the Canterbury Tales, published in four volumes by Eric Gill's Golden Cockerel Press, and the Ashendeen Press's Apollaeus, the intricacy of which resulting from the use of a silk brocade fabric rather than detailed inlays. And lastly, I couldn't resist showing this cute little miniature book. <clears throat> but let us return to the jeweled binding. Sangorsky and Sutcliffe became known for this type of binding and several can be found in notable collections around the world. It seems that the firm used the jeweled bindings primarily, if not exclusively, for unique works composed entirely of handwritten and illuminated texts, uh, texts accomplished by Francis Sangorsky's brother, Alberto. The text of this volume is Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott, illustrated with three uh, painted miniatures, two of which can be seen here. And just by way of example, these are not items held uh, at Bridwell, but these are two other items uh, that fall within this category of works by, by Sangorsky and Sut Sutcliffe. The one on the left is perhaps their most famous jeweled and illuminated work, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, popularly known as the Great Omar. It was commissioned by John Stonehouse in London with instructions that money was no object, and in fact, the more expensive the better, so long as the results justified the cost. It was completed in 1912 after two years of work, just in time for it to set sail on the Titanic. Uh, fortunately, the Lady of Shalott has thus far endured a better fate. We come to our final book of the day, the 1969 publication of Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, illustrated by Salvador Dali. It was published by Mycenas Press, a division of Random House and released in an edition of 2500. The edition is large, nearly 17 inches tall and comprises unbound folio sheets housed in a clamshell box. The work was reissued in 2015 in a bound edition of just 26 centimeters in height and a more accessible price. Those of you who may be able to see me, I, I was able to find this copy on Amazon for about $20. 
for the publication, Dolly created 12 heliogravures, uh, one for each chapter, as well as a four color etching for the frontispiece. In contrast to the photorealism associated with Dolly's paintings, the illustrations for his books are often more gestural, combining the fluid washes associated with watercolor and the sketchiness of pen and ink drawings. Dolly created illustrations for a number of books during the course of his career, three others of which are held by Bridwell, including his grand five volume edition of the Bible with text in the Latin of the Vulgate. This edition was previously displayed at the Meadows Museum in its 2016 Dolly exhibition. The images from this publication were also reissued as illustrations to the smaller and more accessible Jerusalem Bible published by Doubleday in 1970. In 1946, Doubleday had also published Dolly's illustrations in the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini. Although perhaps less grand than the Alice, the autobiography was also published in a limited edition of just 1,000 copies, of which you can see that Bridwell Library holds number 641, signed by Dolly himself. And lastly, I was utterly delighted to discover that Bridwell holds Dolly's 1973 cookbook, Les Diner de Gala. In contrast to the other books for which Dolly provided just illustrations to texts written by others, Les Diner de Gala is entirely Dolly's creation, making it more akin to an artist's book. Um, this title was reissued by Tashin in uh, 2019, for those of you who might be interested. So I have no idea how I did on time here. Uh, I hope I'm within our, our scope. Uh, I want to thank you for attending. This is an example uh, or a picture of our reading room. Um, we've been closed for about a year and a half now, not just because of the, um, uh, the pandemic, but because we're undergoing a major renovation. Uh, I we don't have a firm date yet on when this is gonna be done, but I believe we're hoping to be open to the public sometime in July maybe August, um, but uh, when we are open, I, I wanna remind everybody that the library is accessible to anyone. You don't have to be a student or faculty or staff member of SMU to use it. We do require um, appointments, uh, but I hope to hear from you if you're interested in seeing anything in person. Well, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, we do have time for questions. You were fantastic on time. Um, so I'm going to invite people to either use the chat box or to um, use the raise hand uh, option of Zoom if you would like to unmute to ask a question. So we'll give everyone just a moment to formulate questions. You know, actually, while, while people are thinking, I actually had a question, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but as you were speaking about the Dali works right at the end, you mentioned a, a heliogravure. Yes. I, I'm not familiar with that. Would you be able to describe that uh, it's process? Really, it's, it's, a, it's a photographic etching process, and it's actually more popularly known as a photogravure. Um, I believe that um, in French, uh, one term is used more generically for photographic processes and one is specific to the photogravure. Um, I, I refer to it simply as the heliogravure because that's how it's referred to in the book. Thank you. So we have one question from Terry in the chat box and she's wondering if you could speak more about how advertising students in specific um, use the library. Yeah, so I've actually had um, one part class in particular that first reached out to me in, oh, when was it, 2018? Um, and it's a class called Text and Image, and it really looks at the layout of images with text. And so um, they've, it, the first class that we did was proved wildly successful and they come back every year. And we, we bring everything out from, um, the, the manuscripts like the one I showed you from 1425 in Venice up through modern and contemporary uh, artist books to see how artists and printers have, have paired these over time. Um, and then a year ago, um, 
Well, the, the instructor for that class uh, brought in some of his colleagues from the advertising department, and there is a class on uh, typographic design that's also taught in the advertising school. And so we did a presentation for them last spring. Unfortunately, we had to do it on Zoom. I think it was one of the first Zoom presentations I did. But uh, it, it was really exciting because you could the students then created their own books um, uh, as final projects and two of them shared digital versions with me online and you could see where they had drawn influences from some of the things that we looked at. But yeah, it's, it's been exciting to bring the advertising department in. That's fascinating. And uh, yes, it's been very interesting to transition to Zoom and to see all the applications. <laughs> Um, so Beth is wondering um, if Bridwell has any future exhibitions planned uh, showcasing manuscripts, you know, outside of the ones you can currently see at the Meadows Museum. Um, well, we we've basically been re overhauling our um, our exhibition uh, schedule, and the only one, the only exhibition that's currently on the books uh, should be opening this fall. And that's actually going to be more focused on um, artist books. And it, um, it's being co-curated by my colleagues, Rebecca Houdeschel and John Speck, who are both artists themselves. And they've, they've selected a really interesting array of books that um, explore uh, idiomatic and creative formats. So not just your basic codex. So I think it's going to be really exciting. Um, we will undoubtedly have have manuscript exhibitions coming up, but we I don't have one on the, the calendar as of yet. Um, but if there is anything that you're interested in looking at, I encourage you to let me know. I did a presentation back in 2017 um, for um, Calligraphos. It's the Dallas Fort Worth area Calligraphers Guild. And um, uh, that was also uh, via PowerPoint because they, they, the group meets on a Saturday and, and the library is generally, or special collections is generally locked on those days. Uh, but I did do a presentation of a number of the manus uh, illuminated manuscripts for them. So I'd be, I'd be happy to share that or um, you know, talk with you about seeing other items. Great. So someone just commented that you can also use, obviously, Bridwell's uh, website to continue to explore the collection. Um, but there's another question that just came in. So Terry writes, are, book, are the books printed in inks without chemicals more easily preserved? Printmakers are embracing inks like these today um, for health and environment. So it sounds like she's, she's interested in the, the long-term effects of these types of inks. It's a really good question, and I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, I can tell you, however, though, that the um, you know, it's, it's more commonly um, uh, known that the, the, the early papers tend to be longer lasting. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a similar uh, uh, result found with the early inks, but people are very surprised when they look at a 15th century book to see how, how like white the pages are um, and how dark the, the inks remain. And so um, they, they, they do hold up very well. I'm not sure about more contemporary inks. I, I do know that the wood pulp paper that was started in the mid 19th century proved to be disastrous um, as the chemicals that were required for uh, processing the wood pulp um, were very strong. And they discovered over time that they broke down and formed the acids that we're familiar with. Unfortunately, with most new processes, including conservation processes, we don't really know what they're going to do until a number of decades, even after they've been introduced. Um, but uh, I, I would be interested in learning more about what contemporary book artists are doing in regards to inks. Thank you. Leslie has sent in a question, um, wondering if there are more miniature books, the kind of hand size ones. Are, there's more, are there more of those in the collection? Yes, we actually have an extensive collection of miniature books. And I believe most of them that we have were donated by, um, uh, okay, I'm having a brain moment. Um, let's see, I'm sure somebody here will, Stanley Marcus. Yes, thank you, Jane. 
uh, were donated by Jan Stanley Marcus. And I, I believe, I'm not sure how these were divided up, but I believe that the de Gaulier Library also has an extensive collection of Marcus miniatures. Uh, but we have some from Stanley and others that were collected and donated over time. Um, it's really a, a fabulous collection. I just acquired a new one also. There's a, um, a 20th, 21st century book artist. So he's a, a geometric abstractionist from England who currently lives in France who produced a miniature book um, uh, in the last couple of years and that, that's my latest acquisition. But yeah, we have many. Great, and I think kind of as a final question, I'm curious once you're able to, to welcome people back in, how would one go about making an appointment? The best way is to email me, um, which you'll see my email there. It's simply my name, arvid at smu.edu. You can also find contact information on our website. Um, I, I prefer email just because I can, what I, what I really like people to do is to tell me, you know, what they're interested in seeing or if they have a general question about materials that I need to do some research on first. Um, and having it in writing is really helpful for me. Um, as well as um, if you can provide optional dates and times for when you might want to come in. Um, these days we're, we're down staff a little bit and I do a number of classes and things as well. So I wanna make sure that um, I am there when you arrive and we have everything uh, pulled out and ready for you in advance. Well, thank you so much for all the work you've put in today into this really wonderful presentation. We so appreciate this as well as your involvement behind the scenes with the Fossils to Film exhibition and, and the mobile guide. So thank you so much. And I'd like to thank everyone else for joining us today.